Hi everyone and welcome to CodeFX and Java 12 switch expressions, which means that instead of writing code like this, you can write it like this. Awesome, right? We're going to get into that today, but it's going to be a little different than usual. It's going to be more relaxed. Uh, it's Sunday afternoon. It has to be a glorious weekend, all of all sun and all good weather. I've been outside a lot. Uh, I had a beer earlier today, and so I think I'm more in the mood of just like slowly walking you through this thing instead of live coding and, you know, being all intense as usual. Another reason is that IntelliJ doesn't yet fully support this, or at least I didn't get it to work. So it shows a lot of compile errors where there really aren't any. And so I'm going to show you this today. Instead of live coding a thing, I'm going to show you in Atom uh, how it looks. We're going to step through the pre-made code. Uh, I'm going to show you how it looks that way. Now what else? Oh yeah. Um, there, this is the preview feature. This means that uh, while you can use it in Java 12, it's not yet really finalized. It might change over the next one or two releases. And that means that you have to use uh, special command line flags to make a compiler work. You can see that in the example repository that's up on GitHub. You'll find a link in the description box. Uh, and I may also make a video about that in the future, in which case there should be an eye up there maybe. Also, this means that it could evolve over time and could actually look different. So if you're from the future, if you came here from 2020, where you have Java 16, maybe, I don't know, um, then it, this may look different, which once again, uh, there should be links in the description box and maybe yet another eye up there that shows you uh, the updated video. If you didn't see any, then that means this is still all perfectly uh, correct. I think that's all I wanted to say. Check the description box for links. And uh, yeah, that was the message. <laughs> okay, let's, let's get this on. Um, now, let's start with uh, uh, the common use case where you want to switch over something. In this case, we want to switch over an enum and not just an everyday enum. It's the dreaded ternary boolean, which has a true and a false and a something else. In this case, final found, because hey, why not? So the basic assumption is that we want to somehow work with this crazy boolean. And uh, the first way to do this is to write a regular switch statement, which I'm showing you here. A regular switch statement uses uh, usually you declare a variable that you want to assign stuff to and then you switch over the thing in this case the bool variable which oh by the way I'm using var here if you don't know about var up there um, so um, we're switching over this variable and then of course we have the typical case statements and if, the, the, if that's the case then we assign the result we want to have to the variable and then we do the same for true and false and then this case for find not found I'm not sure whether you heard that but it sounded like a shot Ah, this is Carl's with that. There's no shooting here. Um, so the third, the, the crazy third case, find out found, we would decide to throw an exception. But, you know, maybe somebody is going to add a fourth Boolean thingy here because apparently there were th two didn't suffice, so they had a third. Maybe they're going to add a fourth in the future. So you want to have this, this default case here as well. So to guard this, uh, this switch statement against future uh, ev evolution of the bool type. Now that's all fine and dandy. First of all, if this would be actual production code, I would write a little bit differently. I would probably ex uh, extract the whole thing into a, its own method so I can use return instead of assignments. But uh, still, uh, let's use this one because then I can demonstrate, for example, how you have to uh, break here because otherwise you fall through into the next one, right? You know that uh, switch fall statements fall through, uh, which is nice if you write like compiler code or something, I guess. But in most uh, more advanced cases, uh, where you use like proper business prod objects. This is not actually an, an advantage, it's more like a disadvantage usually. Uh, so that's one thing you have to break here. Uh, you have to make all these assignments because, yeah, we're gonna see why, uh, what you can't do yet. And then here we're going to throw, we're gonna declare an exception, throw it. And then down here, we're gonna have to declare a different uh, variable because we can't use the same name again. If we would, oh, if we, would then we get a compile error because we're already using that variable. That's stupid, right? I mean, it's in a different, it's in a different uh, switch branch. Why does it collide? But it does. So we have to do it like this. Okay, this works now. This is the, the state of the art Java 11 code that you may write. But now enter Java 12, enter switch expressions. What does expression even mean? So. Um, in programming languages, you have either statements or expressions. Well, we have, I guess you have a bunch of more things, but you have these two as well. <laughs> um, cheers. An if statement means 
if the thing is true, do this, else do that. It's very imperative. The ternary operator, on the other hand, goes a different route. It's, well, if this is true, then the whole thing gets the first value, else, the colon, the whole thing gets the other value. That means this, the whole thing, gets evaluated to a specific value. The whole thing is an expression. The if is a statement, the ternary thing is an expression. And this is the same evolution that switch is going to go through. At the moment, we have a switch statement, which says, k is true, assign this and then stop, and k is false, assign this and then stop. From Java 12 on, switch can optionally also be used as an expression. Let's look at that. So let's scroll down here. This is the thing I want to talk about, the switch expression here. So there's a bunch of stuff going on. Uh, let's go through it one by one. The first one is that the whole switch thingy ends with a semicolon, which is semicolon? I guess semicolon. Uh, because now it's part of another statement. It's an expression that's part of a statement. Which means that also has a return value. So you can see here that we're going to assign whatever this whole switch thingy ends with to a variable called result. That's pretty cool. Now we're going to use uh, a lambda style syntax, which is, by the way, you don't have to use this one. We're going to see later how that it can still use the colon. But here you can see that if the bool thing is true, the result of a switch expression is going to be the Java true. And if it's going to be this crazy bool false, it's going to be Java false. And if it's crazy bool file not found, then we throw an exception. And in the default case, we're also going to throw an exception. We're going to see later how this is not uh, strictly necessary that we can, we don't actually have to add this manually. So there's a bunch of things that are set going on. First of all, switch gets a value, uh, which means it's an expression that's going to be evaluated as a whole. Then we're seeing this lambda style syntax going on here, which I find very nice. It's very clear to read case true, map to true. That's cool. Uh, we don't have fault true anymore. There's no break statements here. Uh, this is the entire thing that's going to be evaluated for this case, which is pretty cool. Then the compiler checks exhaustiveness. I'm going to go into that in the future. Uh, yeah, in the far future, no, <laughs> in the next couple of minutes. And the other thing is that on the right hand side can be an expression like it's here. And it can be an exception, which you can see here. And it can also be an entire block, which you're going to see in a second. So this all, it's still it's kind, of, kind of what we're used to. It's just slightly different. Now let's go through a lot of the, this is the whole, this is the big picture. Now let's go through a lot of the details um, that I just mentioned in passing. And let's have a look at how exactly um, they impact uh, how you want to use this. So first of all, let's start with blocks. What you can do let, is this thing. You can say k is true and then arrow. And then instead of having a single statement, you can have a longer block that you put in the regular block uh, curly braces. This is something we're used to with lambda expressions. It's the same, same idea, right? If you have something that works in a single line, you just have arrow that thing. And otherwise, you have arrow and then a couple of statements in curly braces. It's the same thing here. What's different is that we're not using return here. That's weird. We're using break, break with a value. So at first, I was kind of like, kind of like, was weird. I felt like, why don't we use return? We're used to using return to return a value. So why are we using break here? But actually, it works better because we're used to using break and switch uh, statements and now also in switch expressions. But the other thing is, if you would use return here, then you could think like, do I return from the switch expression or do I return from the entire method? That would be kind of like, wouldn't be terribly clear what exactly is going on. You would have to know what's going on. With break, that's much easier. Break means out of the switch expression and return would mean out of the entire method. So now you can write break and you would say break and then this and that value. Are we doing the same thing with false here? And now we're having a block for the find out found case. And now you can see that in both of these instances, we're using the same variable name because since we're having a block here, we also have block scope. So the variables are only visible within the scope, which means if you have longer branches and you reuse similar or the same variable names, um, then this gets much easier now uh, because you don't have to come up with new names, which is pretty cool, I think. So that was about blocks. Uh, if you have a single statement, no curly braces, no break, just case whatever arrow the thing. Otherwise, case, uh, true or whatever, arrow and then curly braces the entire block. Okay, that's that. Now, what is also new is that a case statement can have various clauses to match. This is like, so the whole switch expression thing is like a first step towards pattern matching, which I'm not going to go into uh, in more detail. But that case is a little more powerful in the past. It's also part of those steps. 
In the case, in the past, case would just be one thing to test against, and now case can match several things. So in this case, uh, we want to check whether bool has some uh, some sane value, and if it's true or false, that's sane for a boolean. Uh, but if it's find out found, then that's just crazy, and if it's default, it's just the same. So we want to map these things, and we want to map true and false to the same value. So we're in uh, in uh, before switch expressions in a statement, you might have used fall through for this uh, to have the first case and then the second case without the break in between. Now you can just simply enumerate these uh, these expressions uh, the, to check against on the same in the same case and then arrow to the same result. That's pretty cool. What doesn't work, which I would have found nice, I'm not sure why that would have improved, but in this case when I did, when I experimented with this, something like this, I thought this would have been nice. Um, to have default and some specific case in the same branch, um, but that doesn't work. And if you think about it, it's also not uh, it's also not necessary because you can just remove this and it would be the same result. So you can mix default in a specific case, but you wouldn't have to anyways. So that's fine, I guess. Okay, um, what else do we have? Um, da -da 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 -da. Oh yeah, that's pretty cool. Next one. With, with a switch statement, if you uh, would use the return syntax, if we would say switch over, in this case, switch over boolean, or bool, sorry, switch over this bool, and then case true, return true, case false, return false, case find out found, return false true, whatever, or throw an exception, then the compiler would not have been happy because it would have pointed out that there may be another case. You would have had to add default all the time. This is not necessary anymore with uh, switch expressions. Uh, the switch expression can check whether the whole block is exhaustive. That means if you're switching over an enum, did you cover all the specific instances? If all the instances are covered, then you don't need a default branch anymore. Now, so that, 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 that part is clear, yeah, right? Now this Boolean has true, false, and find not found. And if we get all of these three covered, uh, then we can see uh, that we can, you can see on the right side now it compiles. And now we have this exhaustiveness thing going on here. Um, so that's fine. That works. Because the compiler can check that while it compiles, we covered all the cases of bool. Now, what might happen is that uh, bool and this whole class here is not are not living the same artif artifacts. And then maybe in the future, uh, somebody added yet another, another case, another instance to the, uh, to the bool enum. And you end up with a situation where there now there are four cases. So what would happen then? If you have a regular uh, switch statement, which out return, which just assignments, then that would mean you would just not assign any value to the variable. So if you go back to the case up here, to the default switch statement case, if you wouldn't have this, then that would mean that result would still be uninitialized in this case because it's a primitive boolean would be false. So it would silently just go out of the switch statement. Um, with switch expressions, the compiler does something different. It decides to slip in this default clause. It slips in a default clause, which will throw an error if any new case comes up. So the thing that we did manually before, it, the compiler does that for us. It basically says, like, look, apparently uh, bool changed over time, and now it does, this doesn't match the switch statement anymore, so fix it, basically. And if you look at the, um, uh, at the example repo up on GitHub, uh, we will find a script in the root directory which you know does these things and plays around with it so you can see the actual error message which at this moment as of october 2018 is not terribly uh terribly uh verbose it doesn't really tell you exactly what the problem is but i guess it will be improved so that means exhaustiveness compiler checks whether you cover all the cases that's cool i did say cool an awful lot right well I guess <laughs> I have something to blame. I just blame it on the beer, but I think it's just like my throat or something. So maybe I shouldn't blame it after all. <laughs> I'm sure, I hope this is not going to come back to bite me in the future. Someone's going to point out, that's the guy who always drinks beer in his videos. Which is totally not true. It's the first time I do this. Now. We covered exhaustiveness. Next up, no fall through. I already mentioned that before, that if one of the clauses match, 
and one of these uh, the statements is executed, then the next one uh, will not be executed. And you can easily observe this here in the no fall through method. We're setting bool to true. So to our crazy bool, we set it to true. And that means when we switch, it will always be this case, always. So when we execute, that, then we would, if this would fall through, we would see, uh, would expect to see both. Bool was sane and bool was, in, was insane. But if we check, we don't, we just see the first one. So that means, as I said earlier, no fall through, this demonstrates that. Once again, makes code simpler, easier to write correctly, easier to read. I think that's a good decision. Now, before we come to void expressions, let's do that later. Let's come to poly expressions. Uh, I mentioned poly expression in the video about var. Uh, a poly expression is something that does not have its own type. So for example, if you write something type or var, variable name equals, and then in regular quotation marks, foo. And the compiler knows foo must be a string. This, the, the, the type of this thing on the right side, the right hand side from your perspective, this is definitely a string. If you write blah, 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 blah equals new user. Now the thing on the right side is a user. There's no doubt about it. But not all expressions are like that. The most, uh, the most uh, important ex uh, ex um, exception are lambda expressions. A lambda expression does not have its own type. The compiler has to look at the left-hand side to see, oh, you want to create, or let's say, a function. Okay, so you want to create a function from string to int. That's what it says here. So let's see whether I can make this lambda mit, uh, match that function from string to integer. That's what I said, right? String to integer or the other way around? Whatever. So can that lambda fit that type? So it doesn't have its own, doesn't have its own type. This expression is a poly expression. It can have various types. So. Switch expressions are kind of similar. They're, I, I think uh, they're kind of in between. So let's start um, with the case, with the, with the obvious case, where we go, where we do this. We have, we have a string message equals the switch expression. And then if it's true or false, we go to sane. And if it's default, we assign it a new exception. We don't throw the exception, we assign an exception. And then we say that all of this goes into a message of type string. And now as expected, you get a compile error because it doesn't make any sense. The new legal argument exception is not a string. So that much is obvious. That should be an ex exception. That should be a compile error as it is. Now what would be a super type for both of these? Uh, serializable is actually both. So all exceptions are serializable. Strings are serializable. So if we do this, then this works. So what that means is if the left-hand side has a specific type, then each branch has to match that type. If it does, it's fine. If it doesn't get a compiler. But you can still use var here, which is interesting because usually you cannot use var which, with a poly expression because then the left-hand side doesn't know what's up because it's a var and the right-hand side doesn't know what's up because maybe it's a lambda and then the compiler doesn't know what to do and it bars. With switch expressions, that is not the case, interesting enough. So what you can do here is, as you see, it works. Um, you can see the var message here that it gets executed. So we say true and false as a string and the default is the legal argument exception. And then the compiler infers a type for var message. And I would have to decompile the bytecode, which I'm way too lazy on this Sunday evening or late afternoon. So I'm not going to do that. But I would assume that it would infer not object because that would be, it could infer object because it always works. It does not infer string or exception because that would not work. Uh, I would guess it, it, it uh, infers a common supertype, which could be, which would involve serializable. It could actually be a union type of serializable and something else. But I think serializable would be the only thing that matches here. So I would guess, if you look up the byte, in the bytecode, that var message is declared as a serializable. Remember, var is a pure compile time feature, no runtime component. Now let's go back to void. That's kind of interesting. I thought about this and I tried to figure it out. So if, I don't know if you know this, uh, because there's actually no, I have rarely any use case for that. Uh, oh no, it's not this one. Um, but Java has a type called void. And the only instance you can assign to a void is a null. So the only thing that works is this void f equals null. So this, let's comment this out again. And then let's compile and let's see whether I was right. Yes, okay. So <laughs> this is the only thing that works. There's no other way that you can set a void variable than null that I know of. Now, I thought, what about a switch statement that doesn't return anything, that has no type of its own? 
right? So true and false get printed, something gets printed to the terminal and for, for find out found something else get printed to the terminal. So my idea was the right hand side doesn't have a type so maybe the compiler would allow it to have the type void kind of but come to think of it so first of all that's not the case you get a compile error which is funny because it says void cannot be converted to void <laughs> uh, but it makes sense because that's usually in java, common in java if you have a method that doesn't return anything you cannot assign the result to any variable of any kind so it makes sense that switch expressions don't do that either but uh yeah i was curious to, to figure that out um that's that's uh that's the void expression which does not work so let's put comments here again and that brings us to the last point, oh no, the second to last point, which is other types. The JEP, and I forgot the number right now, but once again, links down there, all the links down there. The JEP mentions that maybe in the future you can match against other things, like doubles, for example. And that's kind of interesting because, first of all, there's no real reason why you shouldn't be able to match against the double. You, uh, you're able to match against an int. And, but you can't cover all the int cases anyway, so you usually say like int 0, 1, 2, this thing, and then default something else. So that should work with a double as well. I don't know why it doesn't work yet. Maybe it's because equality for doubles can be some kind of problem, um, or at least between floats. So I don't know what the reason is, but it still doesn't work. Uh, not yet, even though the JEP mentions that it might, and maybe if you're one of those people from the future, uh, then it could already work for you. But it doesn't work yet as of October to 18. You get switch D, incompatible type, possible lossy conversion from double to int, because switch only works over ints and doesn't yet work over doubles. That would be nice though, uh, to get more types to switch over. Now, final thing. So we covered that before we go there, let's, let's reiterate what we did. We saw how we can take a switch statement which uses, uh, which uses break and which cannot, it doesn't have its own value. And uh, to evaluate something, we basically go through all the cases and assign, we take some other value, so some other variable, and assign a value to it uh, through all of these branches to make sure we get what we want. And then we've seen how we can transform that to switch expressions, which uses case whatever arrow. And then we've seen all kinds of details, how this specifically, uh, how this works um, for blocks and for how it's not fall through and all kind of stuff. Now, what's, what's uh, interesting is that the lambda syntax, the arrow thing, is optional. We don't have to use that. Switch expressions work just as well with colons, so with the regular colons. So, uh, I made a critical example here. This example uses multiple case labels. So that works. You can have true, false, and then the colon. That didn't work before, that works now. Uh, you don't have any fall through because if you use the syntax, you have to use break. If you want to return a value, um, you have to use break. So that means you automatically cannot fall through. Then, oh yeah, I didn't mention that. Uh, this thing here with the colon also is evaluated to a value. You can assign the result to a variable. So we have true and false covered in one of these uh, multiple case labels. We don't have fall through. We have blocks um, as, uh, as we expected. So we, can, we could have reused the thing message. And also, unlike with the switch statement, this thing uh, will verify exhaustiveness. In the end, what we do here, when we execute this, we get switch expression with colon, which does something. And the interesting part is that this is exactly equivalent to what switch expression does. Never mind that there's a different value, the different result here. I always roll the dice in each method. So uh, that's why it's different. This one is false and this one is ridiculous. But the point remains, this is the same logic that you can encode in both of these. So if you don't like the lambda syntax, then you don't have to use it at all. Personally, I think I would prefer it. First of all, I like the idea of, in, of like having input that I map to an output. Then also you don't have to have a break. You're just like gonna write the expression on the right-hand side. So I think I'm pretty sure that the error will become uh, the default. But if you don't like it, you can still use colon here. So talking about the default, what, what could happen in the future here? Is this gonna be the new default or is it just like an alternative approach? Now, with the var, there was a lot of hmm and hawing. Like, yeah, like var is nice, but don't do it in this case. Like, there's a lot of trade-offs involved. As far as I, like, as far as I know now, and I've been 
thinking about this for maybe I've been experimenting with this for a day and thought about it a couple of um, known about this for a couple of weeks so thinking about it back and forth I couldn't really come up with any negative with any downsides so I would think that using the new syntax will become the default that would be just be um, unless you you opt into fall through unless you explicitly want fall through I would guess that the vast majority of uh, use cases I would assume all use cases would just be uh, covered as well um, by the new switch expression lambda syntax mostly even better because you can get rid of the break which makes the whole thing more succinct you can maybe get rid of the default uh, depending on whether you've been exhaustive and so I think uh, oh yeah and also it gets its own value which means the switch expression has its own value which means you don't have to assign anymore you can just be uh, the thing that I want to have equals switch blah so I'm pretty sure that in the future pretty much everybody will use uh, will use uh, switch expression with the arrow and if you're one of those people from the future let me know uh, anyway uh, either way uh, if you agree or disagree with what I just said if you think if you have any questions uh, if you think, oh, this is just fucking stupid or whatever, leave a comment down below. I would, I would like to answer them. And I would maybe in the future, if you have some interesting questions, I will pick them up and uh, discuss them in a future video. Also, even if you got all of this covered, I'm sure other Java developers uh, down there in the description may have questions. So help them figure this out. While you're down there, uh, subscribe, like the video. You can follow me on, uh, on Twitter. Uh, I've, there's a site, courses.codefx.org, where I will publish online courses and you know do all the nice things uh, that you can do on the internet and so with that said I'm pretty close to the sunset you know what I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna show you the sunset other than that I'm gonna say bye already let's see Oop. this is how I record sound let's see the sunset Whee! Whee! it looks way worse on camera than it looks in real life uh, now it gets better, right? So, as I said, bye-bye.